In vitro models allow us to reduce animal use. It also allows us to refine our approach. So we can use in vitro models as a pilot approach if we're unsure about a certain ingredient or whether we're unsure about a certain dietary matrix. Before feeding it to the animal where maybe we need to rerun a study because how we fed it, what we did, what the outcomes were, weren't necessarily what we were looking for. Welcome to the Swine Nutrition Black Belt Podcast, the latest swine nutrition research digested for you. I'm your host, Clayton Chastain, and today we have with us Dr. Kara Cargo Froome, a postdoctoral researcher at the University of Guelph. So Kara, I know it's been a little bit since you've been on the show, but just as a reminder for the audience, would you mind giving a brief introduction about yourself? Yes, uh, thanks for the introduction. So as mentioned, I'm currently working at the University of Guelph. And my background has been quite broad. My master's focused on canine nutrition. My PhD focused on swine nutrition with an emphasis on protein quality and how we measure protein quality in addition to the utilization of pulses for swine. And my postdoc has taken a little bit of a turn in a different direction. I'm currently working uh, with horses and looking at in vitro models. But that's what we're going to discuss today is how we can apply those in the swine industry as well as in swine research because in vitro models are cross, applicable across many different species. And we actually use a lot of the swine in vitro models to build upon for other species. Yeah, exactly. And I think you prefaced it pretty well there before I even introduced the topic, because with the work that you've done on your, with your research regarding amino acid digestibility and bioavailability, um, especially with those in vitro studies, um, I know you have a ton of experience. So I guess to start us off, why did you use the in, vi the in vitro approach and what all has your team learned from these studies? So there's a lot of reasons why we use in vitro. Uh, one can simply be in vitro is a more rapid um, model to be able to measure digestibility or nutrient kinetics than in our animal species. And that's because we don't need to adapt an in vitro model to a specific diet. Uh, sometimes it can be uh, less expensive. So it, again, depends on the model you're using. For example, dynamic models are going to cost more. But if you're using a static model in the lab, it can be cheaper to run these uh, different types of studies versus using animals. And then one of the big topics is the reduction of animal use. So when we think about animal care, we think about animal welfare and the discussion around that. In vitro models allow us to reduce animal use. It also allows us to refine our approach. So we can use in vitro models as a pilot approach if we're unsure about a certain ingredient or whether we're unsure about a certain dietary matrix before feeding it to the animal where maybe we need to rerun a study because how we fed it, what we did, what the outcomes were, weren't necessarily what we were looking for. And so we can make these modifications, use an in vitro model to give us an idea of digestibility or uh, nutrient kinetics, and then we can apply that to an in vivo system. Gotcha. So the first question I have for you is with this in vitro digestion, how can we incorporate that um, as part of the process for some of these typical animal feed studies? So I think there's a couple different ways. Um, as I mentioned, we can use it as kind of a refinement process. So for example, one thing is if we're looking at amino acid digestibility, but we're unsure about how different nutrients are going to interact within a dietary matrix, we can use that as kind of a pilot test run. Uh, let's run this through our in vitro system. Let's see what those protein or amino acid digestibilities are, get an idea of it, and then we can refine that uh, dietary matrix. We could refine that formulation and then feed it to the animals. So whether that's in research or in industry. Now, there's still a lot of kinks we're working out within in vitro systems. So it's not to say that maybe all of them or some of them are directly applicable, especially to industry right now, but that's where I see it going in the future. Gotcha. So when it comes to these, these in vitro studies, I know there's a lot of different types of study design and setup um, when looking at these animal feed digestion approaches. Um, so what are some of the differences between those different in vitro digestion approaches? 
So there's a couple different approaches. While I haven't run them, I have witnessed um, the pH stat and pH drop approaches. And these are quite rapid approaches. It's either measuring a change in pH over time for the pH drop, or pH stat is measuring um, the maintenance of that specific pH over time through the addition of a basic solution. So those are relatively quick and easy to run because they don't take a lot of time but they don't necessarily apply to all nutrients. So we generally see those being utilized for protein digestion studies um, com rather than say starch kinetics or even lipid kinetics or lipid digestion, starch digestion. Then you have more um, in-depth static methods, I guess is the best word to use. So those would be methods like a two-step enzymatic method or in human nutrition, you have InfoGest, which covers oral, gastric, and small intestinal digestion. And so these are more um, intensive because they are using more enzyme solutions. Digestions are longer. You're considering the different digestive compartments of the animal. And then you can also have dynamic studies. And these all utilize machines that are programmed through a computer and the computer takes in vivo data and creates a specific program for that species or for that specific ingredient um, or your specific run. And what happens with the dynamic systems is there's actually mixing that better mimics peristalsis, but you also have enzyme addition and solutions such as your acidic or basic solutions, which are added in over time based on changes in pH within the different digestive compartments in relation to the computer model, which has been programmed in. So these are a lot more expensive and time consuming because you can't run nearly the same number of ingredients at one time. Usually it's limited to one ingredient per run, but it better mimics what's happening in the gastrointestinal tract. That being said, depending on the system you're using, again, like our pH drop or pH stat, you may be limited to analyzing one nutrient, where with your two-step enzymatic digestion, you can look at multiple different nutrients, such as starch and protein within one run. Gotcha. That makes a lot more sense. So next question is, whether it's a nutritionist or a veterinarian or a researcher, what are some of the considerations for in vitro studies that researchers should be aware of? So some big considerations are that, especially when we look in the animal side of studies, there's no real standardization. While there are common methods that may be utilized, such as in swine, the boysen Fernandez method is a very common one that's utilized and or modified. There are still other studies that may be using different enzyme activities. Um, different enzymes in general. So for example, one study might use a uh, pancreatin that has a specific labeled activity for lipase, protease, and alpha amylase. But another study may just use a uh, one times or four times USP. And so those are harder to um, determine the specific enzyme activity, unless you're doing enzyme assays, which is then going to add more time on. So there's a whole bunch of different layers you need to consider within the in vitro studies because we're trying to mimic what's happening in the digestive system. But that also means you need to consider what type of buffers you're using, what type of acidic solution for the gastrointestinal or for the um, for the gastric section, if you're doing a two-step enzymatic digest. If you're doing dynamic, you need to consider the different in vivo studies that are going to be used as inputs to determine your specific model for running the samples and adjusting the different enzymes and the different solutions that are going into the system. But I think the biggest takeaway is that uh, unless we standardize approaches, it's hard to compare study against study if they're not using the exact same enzyme activities, the exact same solution concentrations, and the exact same um, makeup of their solutions. And so when we're thinking about applying it, we have to remember that the outcomes directly apply to that system, not necessarily broadly across different systems that are going to have those different factors in play. A leader in swine nutrition solutions driven by science. Novus' products and services look at the whole animal, focusing on productivity and well-being, in order to feed the world affordable and wholesome food. 
For more information, visit Novus' website at www.novusint.com. Gotcha. So you mentioned how we kind of need to standardize the process a little bit in order to make the results of some studies comparable across different facilities and different ingredients, et cetera. So what would you say are some of the next steps that need to happen in order for us to progress along that line of standardization? So I think the next steps would, one, to be to gather the nutrition community together to standardize an approach. So one area is, if we think to human nutrition and the info desk, is there were a whole bunch of researchers that came together, so nutritionists, enzymologists, et cetera, to develop this very specific um, model. <clears throat> but one other thing we need to consider with standardization is not only having multiple scientists on board, but we need to make sure that our models correlate to in vivo. So not all in vitro digestion models and not all in vitro digestion studies have been directly correlated to in vivo studies utilizing the same ingredients or diets. And so while there are some studies out there that do compare the in vitro to in vivo and have uh, recorded results that have strong correlations, this isn't to say that all in vitro studies have done this. And so I think correlating our data to in vivo uh, to determine that strength of correlation is going to help us determine which is the most appropriate model and then how do we go forward and standardize from there. Because without that correlation to in vivo, we can only guess that our model is measuring uh, digestibility or nutrient kinetics accurately. Gotcha. Yeah, I agree. Making sure it matches that in vivo study is probably going to be the most important and applicable step um, when looking at these in vitro digestion approaches. But I believe that's all the time we have. So thank you again, Kara, for coming on the show and sharing all your research with us. Thank you. It was wonderful to chat today. Yep. And everyone else, thank you for listening to the Swine Nutrition Black Belt podcast. Please visit us at swinenutritionblackbelt.com. And don't forget to subscribe to our podcast channel. See you when we out in the next episode. See you next week.